Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see a big crowd uh, for this film. Um, some of you have already been attending some of the films in this series, but for those of you who, for whom this is their first time, um, my name is Linda Rugg. I'm a professor in the Scandinavian department at UC Berkeley. Um, and this uh, film series is interesting in the sense that it's kind of a hybrid. On the one hand, um, I have my regular Bergman class that meets in here on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and this is their screening time. So some of the people in the audience are students from that undergraduate class. Um, and then the, it's also open to the public. Um, so the way that I have uh, managed this is that I, I'm going to do a short introduction of the film, which will be for the benefit of my students as well as for the public. Um, and then we'll have the, the screening. Um, once the screening is over, I will dismiss my students. They're going to be allowed to leave because they'll have a chance to discuss the film themselves tomorrow in class. And that will leave time for the audience members of the public uh, to ask questions and, and make comments. Um, the one thing I would like to um, remind you all about uh, or tell you about is that um, our, our comment session, bo both my remarks before the film and the discussion will be recorded. Um, and so if you don't want your voice to be recorded, first of all, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> and second, secondly, um, because it's recorded, we have microphones. And so you must wait until you have a microphone in your hand uh, before you make your comment. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, make that clear before we get started. Okay, so tonight, today we have something completely different, or at least a little bit different, in that it is a comedy. It's not the only comedy that Bergman made. It's definitely the most successful comedy that Bergman ever made. And it's also the one that is best known outside of Sweden. Um, and so it's also the only one in my, on my syllabus. <laughs> right? so, so my class is going to have to enjoy this because this is the last time it's going to be funny. Um, and it's not really that funny either, <laughs> but it is a comedy. Because it's a comedy in the grand tradition of the French bedroom farce. That's what this is. Couples are going to switch partners. Lovers are going to jump from one bed into another. There's going to be fancy dress. There's going to be wine. There's going to be music. It's all there, coming directly from the 18th, late 18th and 19th century France. <laughs> and, and this was true of Swedish theater. Um, until the late 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, Swedish theater was very largely imported um, from other countries, and in particular, France, um, so especially when it came to comedy. Now, Bergman, as many of you probably know, was a theater director. Um, and so he's very much engaged in the theater. And you'll see that there is a theater um, in this film as well. Um, and when he became a theater director after the Second World War, um, he didn't choose comedies usually for his repertoire. That shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, he preferred playwrights like August Strindberg and Henry Gibson and William Shakespeare and Anton Chekhov and other heavy hitters. Um, but, but in this film, he makes a reference to the kinds of comedies that were popular on the Swedish stage in an earlier period. Um, so towards the beginning of this film, we're going to see um, our female lead, uh, who is the actress, Desiree Arnfeldt. She has a, even has a French name. And she is starring, we'll see a little snippet of one of these French comedies that I'm talking about. Um, and Bergman seems to be poking fun at the extreme Frenchness of the names and the manners and this arch dialogue and the way that there's sort of a coy engagement on the part of the actress with the you know, audience sort of fanning herself and looking at the audience. Um, and he also focuses on this earlier, earlier form of theater where the star would sort of step forward and have a monologue, right? And this is going to change in Swedish theater um, around the time of August Strindberg. August Strindberg really hated this old type of, of comedy and theater. Um, and so he wrote treatises, also Strindberg 
was a great hero of Ingmar Bergman's. Ingmar Bergman staged Strindberg's plays many times and, and was very much an acolyte uh, of August Strindberg. Um, Strindberg wrote treatises on dramatic practice um, and he made fun of this kind of of this kind of play as just a form of light entertainment because Strindberg wanted to educate people. He wanted to immerse people in a realistic and psychological experience that was real rather than mannered. And, and he coached, Strindberg coached his actors never to address the audience or engage their friends. You know, you were supposed to be acting as if there was no audience out there. In Spiles of a Summer Night, uh, Bergman seems to make fun of these same theatrical practices that Strindberg critiqued, but then, ironically, the film makes use of them. <laughs> the film is very much based in this whole tradition. Um, it uses flirtatious elements like direct engagement with the actor's gaze, and it's very highly orchestrated, um, very mannered dialogue and gesture, so you're going to see all of this. Um, and why? I mean, so why did Bergman decide to make a comedy like this? Well, one of the explanations is very pragmatic. Um, Bergman's last film before this one was a film called Dreams. Um, the Swedish title actually is A Woman's Dream. Um, and it was a flop. It didn't do very well at all. And his producer said, look, I'm not interested in another one of your melancholy, psychological, Ill. please make something entertaining and something that's going to sparkle and it's going to attract an audience. And Bergman writes, I needed money, so it seemed wisest to make a comedy. Okay. At the same time, when we watch this comedy, we see that there's enough darkness in it to give the viewer a little pause for thought. We have repressed sexuality, manipulations and machinations, betrayal, a failed suicide. Those of you who watched uh, last week's film will realize that failed suicides are a, a favorite theme of Bergman's, um, and so on. And so this lightheartedness is really more of a performance that is meant to mask at some level the seriousness uh, of life. Those of you who are friends of classical American screwball comedy will probably also recognize the machine gun dialogue, you know, the kind of dialogue that you have in His Girl Friday. The people are speaking at an incredible rate of speed. It's a rapid comic delivery that otherwise is not typical of, of the way people talk in Bergman. Um, but what is typical are moments of reflection sometimes literal reflection as characters look at themselves and others in mirrors. There are always mirror scenes and make commentary. Um, another one of the hallmarks of a Bergman film is precisely this interest in theater and performance um, because he's interested in the masks that all of us wear in our everyday lives, that we're always performing on some level with each other. So the theater is important to him and especially he likes to go backstage. Um, and this happens in a lot of his films as well. We go into the backstage and we see, we see the mysterious backstage world where the magic is produced, but we also see the, un, the hidden lives, the lives of the performers. Smiles of the Summer Night was made in 1955, um, and it marks Bergman's entry into the international prize circuit. Unbeknownst to him, uh, Sweden had submitted this film to Cannes, to be considered for the 1956 Comedy Prize. And he claims that he was sitting in the outhouse, his grandmother's farm uh, uh, had an outhouse, sitting in the outhouse reading the newspaper when he read the headlines, Swedish pro pro film wins prize at Cannes, and Swedish film at Cannes creates sensation. And he thought to himself, what the hell film could that be? He was amazed to discover that it was his little comedy. Winning the prize at Cannes brought him securely into the fold of those film directors who had been designated auteurs or authors by the French critics who invented that concept. Um, and the auteur, as you probably all know, is a true artist with an individual and, individual and personal vision whose films are easily identified through a style that is unmistakably tied to the director. By 1958, three years later, the film uh, the French filmmaker and critic Jean-Luc Godard would write an essay that promoted Bergman as one of the greatest auteurs of his age. And it was this little lighthearted film produced under duress that began to earn Bergman that distinction. <laughs> um, 
Bergman kind of bought into this characterization of himself as a noteur, um, and he, he wore a beret during most of this period. Um, yeah, you check it out. You find it. Okay. The film you're about to see features some of Bergman's regular troupe of actors. Ava Dahlbeck is Desiree Arnfeld. She was a frequent, she's a large blonde, very impressive large blonde woman. Um, uh, she was a frequent player, although Americans are a little bit less familiar with her because she appeared primarily in comedies and in lesser known works. Um, those of you who saw all those, all these women uh, may have already seen her, and she is a gifted uh, comedian. And playing opposite her is a very important Bergman actor, uh, Gunnar Bjornstrand. Um, he appeared in the last film we watched, Sawdust and Tinsel, as the theater director. Um, here he has a much larger role. The Maid is played by Harriet Anderson. Uh, who had just ended a romantic relationship with Bergman when he finished the script for this film, and she credits that with, ha with her being awarded the role of the maid. Uh, Anderson played Anne in Sawdust and Tinsel that you might have seen last time, and Monica in Summer with Monica. And though her relationship with Bergman ended in 1955, she went on to occupy very significant roles in a number of important films, including Cries and Whispers. 1972. Her lover in this film is Oka Friedel, uh, who is one of Bergman's stock actors who represents the working class, and also another favorite comic hero, Jarl Kölle, plays the mannered military man, Count Malcolm. Uh, he will appear again in Fanny and Alexander as a lecherous, vain, yet lovable family patriarch. Smiles of a Summer Night has enjoyed an afterlife uh, in Stephen Sondheim's musical, A Little Night Music, produced in 1973, and Woody Allen's 1982 film, A Mid Midsummer Night's Sex Comedy. He doesn't put a very, he doesn't put a, you know, he doesn't soft pedal it. The Sondheim musical features a song that many of you probably know, Send in the Clowns, uh, which strikes a Bergman-esque melancholy note, while also referencing one of Bergman's fav favorite themes, the circus. Uh, it's quite striking how a film that Bergman reluctantly made in a dark period of his life under the duress of his producer became such a success. Let's see how it looks in 2018. Thank you. Okay, I think we can uh, see if anybody has any questions or comments about the film. I have a couple of people with microphones on the side and um, they'll look out for any hands that we have. Yeah, I see somebody there. It's a little hard to get to the middle. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'd read different accounts about the making of this film, you know, you talked about how his producer had told him you need to make something successful. I heard that he was broke and super depressed. He had lost a lot of weight during the making of the film yeah. and that he made it to kind of cheer himself up. <laughs> but then I'd also heard that he just said in retrospect, you know, making the film actually brought him out of the depression. And I just wanted to know, like, what is the real account, did he intend to make this to help himself or did it kind of just turn out that way? I think um, I think it's the latter more um, because uh, from what I've understood, uh, his producer who at the time was Karl Anders Dümling um, had told him that uh, he needed to make something that was going to be entertaining and he was really not in the mood. Uh, you're quite right that um, the way he has told about it and also the way other people have talked about it, like Harriet Anderson has, has also talked about um, that period, um, was that he was, he was not in a comic mood. <laughs> he was kind of in the same position as a young man who attempts suicide, uh, that he was feeling very depressed. He was financially not doing very well. Uh, Bergman had married unsuccessfully, I think a couple times at this point, and fathered a lot of children, and then he divorced, and then he was responsible for paying child support, and he, and he really needed 
um, to be financially successful. Um, but it is an interesting story that um, that he he felt cheerful after having made make made the film. And I think also it was very much the case that when he was honored at Cannes, that that really turned things around for him, both in terms of his own feeling about himself as a filmmaker, that he had gotten this acknowledgement um, from a foreign audience in Sweden, because Sweden is such a small country, um, and there are so many sort of bitter rivalries within the small world of the Swedish art world. Um, it's hard to feel fully supported um, sometimes, but he had the support from the French, who were the major culture broker culture brokers of the time, um, and and that then also made it easier for him to get funded. Once the French had sort of acknowledged that he was this filmmaker, then the Swedish Film Institute um, was more interested in supporting his work. So so this was, I think, both in terms of the mood of the film and the way. The, some, the way some people have interpreted this is, um, it, this Bergman is like uh, the lawyer Egermann, who, who who shoots himself, thinks that he's shooting himself, but in fact it's just soot in the pistol, and then he's able to walk away um, and start his life over again. But that might be putting too much autobiographical content into the film that was already scripted. Um, Certainly, it uh, it was a turnaround point for him in his life. Yes, thank you. Other questions? I have someone here. Well, um, I enjoyed it. I found a lot of wisdom there. It seemed to me, uh, perhaps to stem from Bergman's life, the. Um, a review by Roger Ebert, uh, a very appreciative review, starts out uh, by looking at, at Bergman and uh, some of his experience and the fact that he himself, Bergman, was married five times and had very public <laughs> affairs with at least three and, and more of, of his actresses. And um, Ebert thought that that was related uh, to the film. Okay. Do you have a <laughs> reflection on that? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think that if we think about the way the way that Agerman is described, for example, uh, as a goat, you know, a lecherous old goat, and Desiree keeps saying, "Oh, he doesn't have any feelings above his waist," you know, and this this whole kind of thing. It could be a form of self mockery. And you also have, I mean, you in the in the various male characters, all of them are. Uh, I think that the phrase that is used about Malcolm is that he's a slave to his virility, right? That he can't not sleep with women and it gets him into trouble, right? And so, yes, um, I mean, I think that Ebert is not entirely um, wrong in this observation, but it means that Bergman is very self-aware about this as well. And not only that, um, but that, as I was just saying, Sweden is a very small world and everybody knows everyone else. And, um, and so it was common knowledge that Bergman was a womanizer. Um, and so in the public realm, he's able to sort of point back to himself. Yes, you know, I'm, it's my weakness. I'm a slave to my virility, whatever. I mean, it's a, yeah. And even the, the servant um, uh, who, you know, he says something, I swear by my, I swear by my man manhood. Yeah, I swear by my manhood is what he says. <laughs> this kind of, this constant reference back to, um, back to sex and, and, and masculine sexuality. Although I should also say about that, that um, this is a typical comic motif. I mean, it is, the genre of comedy is geared toward the sensual realm, the, the low, um, you know, the erotic. And, um, and so it's, it's typical of comedy that you would, that you would emphasize sexuality. Um, so he's, he may be making an autobiographical comment, but he's also working very, very much within the genre that he that he chose. Yeah. Are there other people with comments or observations? Yes, I have a person here in the middle. You can maybe pass the microphone down the row. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite lines in the film is when the actress said uh, emphatically that she wanted to be rewarded in this life. In this life. <laughs> not in 
So can you clarify Bergman's uh, view on religion? <laughs> well, okay, so I think I, I, if you've come to my the other presentations, I mentioned that Bergman's father is a pastor. And in this film, you have a young man who is, thinks he wants to be a pastor. <laughs> and he is obviously a figure of ridicule. Um, and his spirituality or his seriousness about virtue is very much called into question in the film. So there's a way in which we're pointing towards the hypocrisy of, I mean, and also Lutheranism is very, very strongly signaled, right? So he's reading out of Martin Luther. That's, those are the readings that he's, the thing about the uh, bird's nest in your hair and this kind of thing. Those of you who are Lutherans have probably heard that before. Um, so I think that in the film, again, you know, we're working within a comic mode, but he, he's pointing to some degree at the hypocrisy of people who, who spout religious, uh, religious uh, sentiments. And also, um, I mean, it, it happens at various points within the film uh, that people either m make fun of the religious or discount it. Uh, Malcolm is sort of like, oh, you're the young man who's going to become a priest, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, they make fun of him. Um, but I think, too, that um, he wants to emphasize uh, Desiree, the, also the actress's very pragmatic side. You know, De Desiree is the one who makes a plan, who stages the whole episode so that all of the people are settled at the end with the people they're supposed to be with. Right, and this is also a comic tradition. It's very, I mean, you see it in Shakespearean comedy, you see it in Moliere, where the mismatches, you know, as you like it, you know, all of these, you have the mismatched couples, and by the end of the piece, you have them all aligned the way they should be. And very often, it, this is very, this is a very old tradition, even to the classical period, um, you have an older man with a younger woman, and this is viewed as something that needs to be repaired, right? So, um, so, so this film is working within that model, but you're right to point to the way that he makes fun of Lutheranism specifically, and makes fun of a pastor specifically, uh, because that is his uh, background and his childhood, right? So, yeah. He knew something about hypocrisy in the pastoral household. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> okay. Are there other people who have comments? Yes, I have someone there. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering if you could put the film into the context of Swedish nobility period. Oh. Because uh, I was struck, you, you think of Sweden today, it's this egalitarian <laughs> society, and now here there's uh, obviously a lot of emphasis on, on rank and status. Okay. Yes, so, and, and we saw this also in the film before. Uh, Bergman comes out of a background, um, you know, he, he was born in 1918, um, but in the world of, of his youth and in the world of, of his parents, especially, um, there was a very strong class-based society. Um, Sweden actually um, talked about five classes. Um, you had the nobility, you had the clergy, you had the military, you had the landed gentry, and you had peasants, right? And that was, it was a very stratified society, um, and very frequently, the, um, very frequently the military were also the nobility, right? So this was a common um, a path for a young noble nobleman to, um, to become a military officer, like Count Malcolm is. And I don't know if you noticed, it's fairly subtle in the film, but Count Malcolm has a scar, yeah, and that's obviously, it's a dueling scar, um, uh, which was, it was common for young officers of this period. So I think that we're supposed to imagine that we are about at the turn of the century, you know, right around 1900 um, with, uh, with the motor car, right? Um, and so we're, we're moving into a modern period um, where it might be possible for an actress to marry a lawyer. That would not have been possible in, in an earlier period. But one of the things that um, I wanted to say, oh, couple, uh, okay, I'll say a couple things about this. Count Malcolm has a, a Scottish last name, does he not? Okay, there, the Scots uh, during the 18th century, 17th century and 18th century, um, fought in the Swedish military. 
um, and became ennobled very often. So you will find Scot Scottish last names among Swedish nobili nobility. That's one of the things I want to point out, because in case you wondered why the Swedish nobleman had a Scottish name, <laughs> you might not have. But the other thing um, is that you can very frequently um, tell what, what's, what class uh, one came from by the person's last name. So Sweden was so uh, stratified um, for such a long time um, that the practice of surnames was not was limited to the upper classes. So if you were a commoner, you were just named, you just had a patronymic, you were just named after your father or your father, right? So your name would be Lars' son, or Peter's son, or Anders' son, right? Those were, those were the peasants. And then when you get into people like the Lindqvists and the Ekbrugt and all of those people that have like tree names with tree parts, or, or, or you have tree names coupled with bodies of water like Ekwe, uh, Oak Lake, those were landed gentry names. And if you had somebody who had an EUS or, a, or just an IUS, the US, like Linnaeus, that person was an educated person very often belonging to the clergy. And if you had a person who was named with a, a, a military weapon or, or a lion, so if your name was Lionheart, or if your name was Hammershield, Hammershield, like Dog Hammershield, that was a military family, a noble family. So to, it, that was a long answer to your short question, but it, back in the day, Sweden was so stratified that even today, if you're introduced to someone and they say, my name is Alvanius, you're like, okay, you, <laughs> your family were educated and the reason you had the US was because you had learned Latin. So your name was Latinized. So Linnaeus's name was originally Linne, and then it became Linnaeus, right? So that long diatribe on names is basically to answer your question is, yes, this, the culture was very stratified to the extent that you I, could identify people very readily by their names, but also by their clothing, by their by their gestures, and so on and so forth. And now, but nowadays, there's still traces of that. So people will say, "Oh, it's a so and so," <laughs> <laughs> meaning they have, you know, they have noble ancestry. But most American Scandinavians, Larson, Peterson, Anderson, Olson, <laughs> because why? Because the poor people left Sweden and came to make their fortune here. Occasionally, you'll meet a Lindqvist. <laughs> OK, other questions or comments, comments that people have? I have someone here. Um, I love this movement. I had no idea Bigman had done anything like it. And, and <laughs> it was so different, so different from most of them. Yeah. And when I, it's hard to think of anything deep to even attempt to say about it. So if there's a question involved, is has anybody tried to be deep in talking about this movie? Of course they have. I thought <laughs> of, <laughs> the only thing I thought of was that, that um, not deep, it's just that it's like, OK, you want me to do this, I can do this. And I, it was amazing, because if anything, Bergman, it's an understatement to say that Bergman is a consummate filmmaker. And I thought it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, as number of parts and the different stories and intertwined plots which all came together was just, I thought yeah. that's why I think I loved it because it was such a beautifully integrated mm -hmm. film with a lot of complexity which had all this. But that's what it was about. He was saying, I could do that too. Uh -huh. I mean, in a sense. I mean, okay. That's, that's what it was okay, so what your, your observation is very correct. And one of the things that Bergman said that was very difficult about making the film was the mathematical precision with which one had to plot this thing, right? Because it, it has these moving parts. It operates according to classical rules of comedy. Um, he's got these couples, and it's, you know, it's, very, it's very basically a mathematical problem that he's solving, right? Um, and there's a kind of a machine-like movie. You have the mechanical bed. That's the sort of the strongest um, sign of, of a sort of a mechanistic way of thinking about how do these pieces of this puzzle, how are they supposed to fit together? Obviously, technically, it's, it's a very well-made film. He almost seems to be making fun of himself at certain moments, like the big reaction shots. Ta -da! Yeah, you're like, okay, really, no. 
but but it's so overblown that it's obviously supposed to excite our laughter. So the the question of whether or not you know, like, if we we sit it in a row with you know the seventh seal and you know wild strawberries, which is a kind of comedy, I would argue almost, but. But, but if you set it in a row with all these very serious Bergman films and you say, does it really fit? Um, but I, I do think that um, there are a number of things that one can argue about it that, that place it in a slightly deeper category because precisely because it does align with some of Bergman's themes. And one of them is performance. That is, at what point do we become our real selves? Um, is there ever a moment when we let the mask fall and we let another person see who we really are? And so much of the film um, is about performance. And many of the characters, like Charlotte, to ex for example, or Malcolm, they seem to they seem to be all they seem to always sort of be in character. At the same time, there's that incredible speech that Charlotte makes when she goes to have lemonade and cookies with Anne. <laughs> She goes into this, this speech where the camera is held on her and she engages with you. She's looking at you, right? This is one of those moments where she breaks the fourth wall is how we talk about it. That is, she, she, she's addressing, almost addressing the audience. And it's about this incredibly conflicted relationship she has with her husband. It's like, I... I hate him, he's hairy all over, he sleeps with all these other women, he talks, 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 talks. And then she goes, I love him, right? And I just want him to pat me on the head and call me his little dog, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, the, the kind of, and this precisely is this, what Bergman is interested in in his serious films is that kind of conflicted, complexity in which we're willing to abase ourselves, you know, in which we, you know, and so there are these moments when it becomes incredibly Bergman-esque <laughs> and you're just going, really? Did she, what was that, you know? Um, and Anne is also, she's listening and her, you know, eyes are getting bigger and bigger, you know? <laughs> she, uh, so there, there are a few moments like that. Um, also, when we look at Frederick Egerman, you know, the protagonist, played by Gunnar Bjornström, he's sitting alone in his office looking at pictures of his wife and he says, I don't understand. I don't understand. And you as a viewer are sort of like, w what, what is it he's not understanding? You know, does he not understand why he married her, why he's so in love with her, why she won't have sex with him, why he continues in a marriage like this? We, but but I but I'm what I'm pointing toward is that in in a simpler mode of film, um, everything is basically explained to you. <laughs> you don't you don't you don't do to try to fill in blanks, and it's at that moment where the blank opens up and you're going, okay, what is with this guy? Okay, there's a very simple explanation because Anne also asks him, why did you marry me? Why did you, why did you marry me? And the simple explanation is, oh, you're 16 years old and. You threw yourself at me and said, marry me, and I just lost my wife. And there are, many, there are a lot of simple explanations for why he might have decided to do something like that. But in fact, he's more complicated than that. It's not just, if we look at classical comedy, a figure like, uh, like Frederick Egerman is usually a fool. He's just a fool. He's just a fool to me made, made fun of. This Frederick, this fool is also a person with whom one potentially could feel some sympathy or at least have some curiosity about him um, because of the way that he himself questions himself at certain moments. He's also an incredible cynic, as keeps, it's pointed out, but underneath the cynicism is some kind of fear. And the fact that we get to see more of him than just the surface uh, points towards a different kind of um, comedy filmmaking than, than some, some other more generic uh, comedies would be, I would say. Yeah, I have someone there. To me, this, I mean, this is another of those that I've seen many, many years ago. Okay. And greatly appreciate your bringing it back. Um, I'm 
curious again about the impact of this film, in particular on the domestic audience mm -hmm. in Scandinavia. It's a film that's, to me, basically uh, ridiculing the old class structure <laughs> yes. at, at a time when uh, the Scandinavian societies, uh, beginning after the First World War, from my understanding of it, and that may be imprecise, we're becoming a mass industrialized society. Mm -hmm. Did it have a mass industrialized audience in mid 1950s? And um, how did they like seeing their purported betters ridiculed? <laughs> were they liberated by seeing this ridicule or bored? Um, you know, it was, it was well received. Um, you know, the hopes for the film were realized that the audiences liked it, you know, and then people were amused. And I think that at the time, okay, there are a couple different things. Um, the, at, in, in 1955, this would have been a nostalgic look back at a world that, um, in, in terms of the class structure, really didn't exist anymore. Um, not in the same way, anyway. And so, and the other thing about this is that um, it's filmed in rural southern Sweden. Um, the southern part of Sweden, which e even today is very rural. Um, and, and so there's a kind of a, um, it's a it, it, it kind of highlights an, an old a past that also had this beauty attached to it. You see the mansion you know, that she lives in, uh, the manor house, I would call it rather, the manor house that she lives in. She was given it for keeping her mouth shut and not writing her. Um, <laughs> she's, she's a great character. But, but, but the avenue of trees leading up to the house, you know, that if you, when he's walking through the streets, I think it's probably Helsingborg. I forgot to check, but it is definitely town in southern Sweden. And there's a way in which there's a kind of a nostalgic identity with the past. And um, I'm trying to think what a what an analogous kind of film would be in America. Um, it's a little hard to it's a little hard to locate something like this in America. But if you period costume dramas are often about a nostalgia, but at the same time, you're not really longing to go back there because there. Because look how, I mean, we kind of laugh at the Petra character, the servant, right? She's funny, um, but she's sleeping with the the son, and then he offers the or her a raise for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that's. That you, that's not something that we necessarily look back with this nostalgia towards, you know, the the the, the way in which people were um, abused really by by their employees. It's it's depicted in a lighthearted way here, and you laugh at the Harriet Anderson, and she's complicit. She's unbuttoning her blouse, and she enjoys uh, flirting with him. But there's there's also this sort of like. Yeah, you could buy people, you, you know, back then. And, and that would, for a social democratic audience of 1955, yes, no, that's not a thing that we would encourage. <laughs> yeah. Other people? I had one other person. I think this might be the last person. I think that this might have something to do with what you said about there's not a lot of depth here, so we don't have as many questions. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You inferred that um, he uh, Berkman made very few comedies. Were there other Relatively ones? There are others, yes. I mean, if you've yeah, been coming there? to the PFA, um, if, if you've been coming to the PFA, they've they've shown they've shown some of the comedies, um, and you know, from an American point of view, they're not you know they're not hilarious, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but th this one is probably the best of the comedies, I would say. Um, I'm very fond of one of his comedies that's called It's Raining on Our Love. Uh, yeah. Hey, do you know that one? Are you, are you raising your hand for some other reason? <laughs> it's like, hey, man. No. Rain, but Raining on Our Love also stars Gunnar Bjornstrand and uh, Eva Dahlbeck, the two, you know, Andre, uh, Desiree and uh, Frederick. And, um, and they're kind of, they become kind of a comic couple together, so they appear in a few of his films that way. And in the It's Raining on Our Love, they have a fantastic scene where they get stuck in an elevator together. That's the spoiler alert. But, um, but Bergman, you know, as, as skillful as he is with this film, um, comedy is not his forte or his interest in, in film or in the theater. 
he he you know he's he, he just doesn't find it um, as interesting or as compelling and he actually finds it very difficult and a lot of people say that right everybody's heard that that it's very hard uh, to make uh, a good comedy that it's easier to make a serious drama in some ways um, I had someone here in the front row yeah comment that Scandinavia was the first part of the world where women were really liberated and had equal power and uh, mm -hmm. going back to the t 10th century. Oh, you're talking about the Viking Age now. <laughs> I mean, no, but that's, that's yeah. really significant. Yeah. It, yeah. When I was first in Sweden, I was going to take a woman out and I went to pay and she said, what do you think? I am your wife. And she, uh, she paid half and I paid half. Yeah. I thought, what a, what a good deal. <laughs> yeah, well, what they call going Dutch could be called going Swedish, definitely, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, okay, so it's, it's definitely true that if you go back and you look at the saga literature, and now I'm, now I'm talking about the Icelandic sagas that were written in the, in the 1200s, largely in the 1200s, um, you see this culture where women had a lot of power and a lot of standing. Um, and and the, I, I'm going to have to make a little pitch for the saga literature right now, even though you did not come to hear about the sagas. Um, it's, they're just so great. So if you haven't ever read any of the Icelandic sagas, they've been collected in a big fat volume uh, called the Icelandic Sagas. Um, and uh, you owe it to yourself to read some. But, but what you find in those are these women who... Um, are perfectly capable of, I, okay, I'll just give you one example. I'm not gonna to waste too much of your time with anecdotes from the sagas, but but there's a famous one, <laughs> okay. So there was um, uh, a woman who, a, a woman who was married to one of the heroes in Njal's saga, his name was Gunnar, and she, um, she was a very difficult person. She kept getting Gunnar into trouble. She would make, she would have fights with the neighbors. She would, and, and, and it, all of the arguments that she got in with the neighbors or with relatives and things would lead to people getting killed, you know, because they would have to go and avenge things. And, and she was kind of egging people on. Um, that's actually a word that we brought into our language from Old Norse. It means to put an edge on something. So egging people on was what these women did. And she got people into trouble by saying, if you were really a man, you would go over there and kill that guy, you know. And so in, in the end, then, uh, her husband gets rather angry at her, and he slaps her in the face. And we had some face slapping in this film as, as well. Um, he slaps her in the face, and he, she looks at him, and he, she says, you're going to remember that you slapped me like that. So a lot of time goes by, lots of things happen. He has trying to defend himself against all the people that she's gotten annoyed, and, and, and he actually uh, is, they're in their house. People are gonna burn their house down while they're in it, which was something that they did back then. And uh, he is trying to defend the house by, it's kind of like a Western film. He's, he, he has a bow and arrow, and he's trying to shoot all these people who are trying to burn down their house. And he's an excellent warrior, so he's kind of holding them at bay, but his, the string on his bow breaks. Um, and so he turns to her and he says, my string just broke on my bow. Give me some of your hair because she has this long hair, blonde hair. And she said, do you remember that time you slapped me? Yeah, that's the kind of woman we're talking about. I, you can't really trace, to be fair, you can't really trace an, a, a straight line from the, the women of the sagas to modern Scandinavian women. But there was certainly a tradition of women having a certain standing, um, and that then gets translated in the modern age through through the magic of social democracy <laughs> to uh, the classless society, um, to women having a very fair and equal standing. Certainly in this film, um, there's still some, pr some problematic features of gender relations. I guess I could get an amen on that. <laughs> but, um, but you do have the strongest character in the film is a, and the director, if we want to place responsibility for direction, it would be Desiree. It would definitely be Desiree. So. I think that concludes our day for today. I hope that you'll come back for more Bergman next week. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks.